My name is Rafael Busso from UC Berkeley, and I'll be chairing the last session of talks. It's going to be an action-packed program, and our first speaker is Nadi Seiberg from IAS. Uh, his title is uh, What is Quantum Field Theory? Thank you, Rafael, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the Breakthrough F Prize Foundation for putting together such a, an interesting, stimulating uh, meeting. I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. As you heard, we were asked to give a view for five years. And I agree with Joe that this is really the most difficult time to give a, an outlook for precisely the reasons that Joe said. But having said that, this is precisely what we do whenever we write a research proposal. <laughs> and many of us wrote a recent proposal, some recent proposals recently, some people in the room also. And I'll follow more or less the lines of one of these research proposals. So by the end of the talk, you can decide whether you want to fund it or not. <laughs> so I want to start with the first. This is kind of the abstract of the research proposal. Well, maybe I should first give you the one line summary. What is quantum field theory? And the quick answer is that I have no idea. And the rest of the talk will be a little bit longer. So this is a part of the main points. So quantum field theory appears to be the natural language in physics. It has figured in almost all, perhaps all talks we heard today. And it will also figure, I'm sure, in the talks we'll hear later today. So it appears in particle physics and condensed matter and cosmology, in string and gravity and so forth. And if that's not enough, in addition to physics, it has applications in mathematics, especially in the fields of geometry and topology. And this is clearly exciting. And therefore, I would like to define quantum field theory as the modern calculus. And I'll spend two more slides soon explaining what I mean by quantum field theory being the modern calculus. In that sense, in a brief comment, this is in a sense, this is the natural language to describe many diverse phenomena. So quantum field theory is not a subject. It is a language, a language that we use to explain and describe a lot of phenomena. And over the past decades, there has been enormous progress. Our picture of quantum field theory now is quite different from the time I was in graduate school. That's a time scale of, say, 30 or 35 years. And that point time, this point in time, it was quite different than 35 years earlier. And there's been enormous progress over these past decades, and the progress continues. And some very senior physicists in the audience, whom I really admire, said quantum field theory is over. We understand that. It's all understood. I really, really disagree with that point. And I'll try to make that precise. The person who said it? Uh, <laughs> I want to live alive. <laughs> and I would like also to emphasize that there are very strong indications that quantum field theory should be reformulated should be reformulated, in, not in the sense that the way we think about it today is wrong, but in the sense that there is another way of thinking about it, which is much better in a way that I'll make precise and more effective. So let me first go into the, analysis, the analogy between quantum field theory and calculus. So calculus started as a new mathematics, which was motivated by a very concrete problem in physics, the motion of bodies. This is what motivated Newton. And then it turned out to have many applications elsewhere, different branches of physics, different branches of mathematics. A lot of mathematics is based on, on calculus one way or another. And it also went to other branches of science and engineering, and even to the social sciences, like in, econo in economics and elsewhere. I think that this is a sign that this is a deep idea. You invent a tool for one subject, and then it turns out to be useful many, many other places. Calculus is also a mature field. So I'm going to propose a criterion for when is a field mature. A field is mature when most textbooks and more, most courses are more or less the same. So you take a calculus course in Stanford or in Princeton, it's more or less the same. The same order for you learn to differentiate, then to integrate, and so forth. The problem has already been streamlined there is one way to teach it. And I will soon contrast that with other fields. So moving to quantum field theory, the analogy, 
So the beginning of the slide, I basically copied. So that's nice with PowerPoint, you just copy the previous slide. <laughs> so we have new mathematics. In fact, it's so new that I believe it does not yet exist because quantum field theory is not yet mathematically rigorous. I'll say more about that soon. It was motivated by physics, very much like calculus. It was motivated by particle physics and condensed matter physics. There were concrete physical picture problems. Quantum field theory was the solution. And then it had applications in many other fields, just like calculus. And again, I claim this is a sign that the field is deep. It was invented for one thing, and it has many other applications. Yet, I think quantum field theory is not yet mature. It's not yet mature because remember the maturity test. Maturity test is that all quantum field theory books would be the same, and all courses in quantum field theory would be more or less the same. And I think here, we really failed the maturity test. One, peop one person writes a quantum field theory book starting with scalars and then interactions of scalars. Somebody else says, no, we'll first do all the free fields, and then we'll add the interactions. And one person starts with a functional integral, and the other does perturbation theory, and so on and so forth. This is a sign that this thing has not yet been streamlined. We don't yet have a coherent, straightforward derivation from beginning to end. And as I said before, there are indications that we are still missing big things. And perhaps the field should be reformulated. So I'm going to recycle here the approximation of a slide I used in the 2011 Solvay meeting, where I suggested that quantum field theory should be reformulated. And the first point was the use of Lagrangians. Most treatments of quantum field theory, most descriptions of quantum field theory, start with the Lagrangian. And that has been very useful. However, it's really deficient. First, there are many examples with no semi-classical limit. So there is no Lagrangian. One example that we all like is that some theory in six dimensions, a mysterious theory in six dimensions, that obviously does not have a Lagrangian and cannot possibly have a Lagrangian. So having a Lagrangian is not obviously the first starting point. There are also examples of theories which have many different semi-classical limits. So the example of a possibility, first we have no Lagrangian at all, or we have the same theory with many, many different Lagrangians. That's clearly a sign that the Lagrangian is not the unique way to think about it because there are different Lagrangians giving us the same theory. Second, there are a lot of examples of solutions of quantum field theory. And these solutions, relying on integrability, bootstrap in conformal field theory in two dimensions or in higher dimensions and so forth, not a single one of these solutions uses the Lagrangian. Not a single one of them. So here, it, we can't say that this is the proper way to think about it when it sometimes doesn't exist, sometimes it exists more than once, and when we want to do calculations, we don't really use it. <laughs> this doesn't look right. Most recently, there, more recently, there is the issue of amplitudes. They exhibit a lot of magic. Maybe this will be discussed later today. The Lagrangian does not do justice to this magic. In fact, most of the magic comes from general consistency condition rather than the picture of the Lagrangian. I would also like to emphasize that mathematicians are very unhappy with quantum field theory. And I don't think this is because they are not smart enough. In fact, I think they are much smarter than most quantum field theorists. <laughs> this is our problem. If they don't understand it, if they don't think it's rigorous, if they don't think it makes sense, it's because we didn't make an effort to make it accessible. And maybe we didn't make an effort because we don't know how to do it. So I really would like to believe that there is another formulation of the theory that is mathematically rigorous, acceptable to the mathematicians that, give us, that will give us new insights. Finally, I want to mention that there are various extensions of quantum field theory that come from string theory that are clearly not local quantum field theory, clearly very interesting structures, non-community field theory, little string theory, and others. They are very interesting, and they don't fall into the, our general framework. So I view all that as indications that quantum field theory should be reformulated, and this is my research proposal reformulate quantum field theory. But in every research proposal, the bulk of the material is not what you're going to do, but what you have already done. So you should describe some recent work toward this work, and that's what I'll do in the rest of the talk. So in the rest of the talk, I'll talk about some recent work with Gayoto, Kapustin, and Willett. And we'll think about quantum field theory abstractly, namely no Lagrangian, just a collection of operators, operators and their correlation functions, and this is quantum field theory, all sorts of operators and their correlation functions. 
And the new thing that we would like, that we are not the first, but the more modern thing is that we should think not only about local operators, but we should also think about extended operators, lines, surfaces, and so forth. For example, Wilson lines, the Tooft lines, and others, and study their correlation functions. Now, if we want to think the theory abstractly, and we have these, all these operators, we would like to organize them in some way. And the, the first thing you do when you want to organize some structure in quantum field theory is to use symmetries. So we are going to think of symmetries and to, in the language of these operators. We are going to think of all these collection of operators and see how we can organize them using symmetries. So what do we do with ordinary global symmetries? They are associated with operators of codimension one manifold. I don't need a Lagrangian for that. This, typically this is space. We take all of space and we act with the symmetry transformation and we find another state in the Hilbert space the state obtained by acting with the, with the symmetry transformation. And the charge operators are point-like. Every operator has a, some charge under that symmetry. And the charge states are particles or zero brains. This is true regardless of whether we use a Lagrangian or not. This is true, this statement about the operators is true regardless of whether the symmetry is spontaneously broken or not. So we are going to generalize this notion by studying Q-form global symmetries. And the only thing we are going to modify is that instead of having here codimension one, we are going to have codimension Q plus one. So Q equals zero is ordinary symmetry. Q equals zero is ordinary symmetry. And they are associated with manifold of codimension Q plus one. And now the charge operators are, say, are extended of dimension Q, for example, li Wilson lines or at Hooft lines. And the start charge states a Q dimensional, there would be Q brains, and these would be, for example, strings. So the idea is to the same way we use ordinary symmetries to classify local operators and particles, use these generalized symmetries to classify extended operators like lines and surfaces. So now what we're going to do is take everything you know about global symmetry, and we have an opportunity to do it again for these new symmetries. So you take the textbook and you say, what do we normally do with Global, sim with global symmetries, we can get selection rules of amplitudes. So we can get selection rules of amplitudes using these generalized symmetries. We could couple them to back classical background fields. For ordinary symmetries, these are twisted boundary conditions. For these generalized symmetries, this is what is known as a Tooft twisted boundary conditions. And we can also gauge the symmetry by summing over twisted sectors. We're familiar with that for ordinary symmetries in the case of, of orbifolds. And in this case, it would leave us to new gauge theories where we gauge this symmetry. And in ordinary orbifolds, we have this phenomenon of discrete torsion. And in this case, we also find new parameters in four-dimensional quantum field theories, which we very much like theta parameters, but these are new parameters, which we call discrete theta parameters. Now, we know that symmetries, the gauge symmetry of a theory is not uh, intrinsic to the theory. We can have different dual descriptions of the same quantum field theory, but with different gauge symmetries. This is very common. But global symmetries should be the same. Since we're talking here about global symmetries, I would like to emphasize that these are intrinsic properties of the theory, and when we have a dual pair, we must make sure that the two dual theories have the same global symmetry. So these are new tests of duality. They are highly non-trivial. All known dualities pass them in flying colors, but in a non-trivial way, because for example, they test non-BPS operators. As with ordinary symmetries, we can do more things. Such symmetries could be spontaneously broken. It's a global symmetry, it could be, spon it could be spontaneously broken. So I'll just mention some facts here. If a spontaneously broken continuous, if they, we have a, this generalized symmetry, it's continuous and it's spontaneously broken, there must be a Goldstone boson. So this leaves, leads to an interpretation of the photon as a Goldstone boson for such a generalized symmetry. The photon is massless because it's the Goldstone boson of a broken continuous symmetry. If the symmetry is discrete and it's spontaneously broken, it leads to a topological field theory at long distance. So this is what our friends, the condensed matter physicists, call long-range topological order. So I would like to argue that a lot of these global symmetries can be identified in the UV. This is a symmetry of the theory. 
At long distance, they are spontaneously broken. And in this case, we get a non-trivial topological field theory in the infrared with observable consequences. We can also use anomalies. Can have anomalies in, in such a theory. And if we have anomalies, the UV and the IR must have the same anomaly. This is a tooth anomaly matching condition. And that could lead to what was described earlier today by John about symmetry protected topological phases. So we can get new phases of four dimensional quantum field theory based on anomalies and anomaly inflows, exactly the same as in his talk, except that here the relevant symmetry is not an ordinary symmetry, but is generalized symmetry. And that has a lot of applications. We can also use it to characterize phases of field theory. Landau gave us a characterization of phases. Landau said if you have a global symmetry, it could be spontaneously broken by the expectation value of a local order parameter. And then we have two phases. The symmetry is broken or unbroken, or the symmetry could also be spontaneously broken to a subgroup. We can play the same thing again. We have a global symmetry. It might or might not be spontaneously broken, and it might or might not be broken to a subgroup. It turns out that this, is, this generalizes and make, gives a more complete picture of Wilson's and the Tooft's characterization of phases. So Wilson and the Tooft characterization of phases in terms of perimeter law and, or, or area law, Higgs confinement, oblique confinement, and so forth, can be completely rephrased. In fact, can be stated a lot more accurately and more completely as exactly the same as Landau's picture of, of phase transitions. It's not, a, it's not a new thing. The lines are not new. I'm almost done. The lines are not new thing. Lines have area law or not. It's exactly the same thing. We follow the same rules, but the novelty is the new kind of symmetry. So clearly, a lot more can be said. I was very brief about that. And it would be in the paper and in the work done in the coming weeks or maybe months. This is the short-term goal. Slightly longer goal, maybe five years. We should uh, continue to study quantum field theory. I don't think the, we've heard the, the last of it, both because of its many applications in different branches of physics and also to understand it better. And maybe within five years, we can even learn how to improve its presentation or perhaps even reformulate it. Thank you for your attention. All right, it's unfortunate that research proposals tend to have page limits. <laughs> uh, but we do have time for a couple of questions. Andre. Well, uh, it seems that you're essentially saying that from the point of view of generality, whatever, uh, Lagrangian is dead now. And I still remember how Landau said that uh, Lagrangian is dead. And I have a conjecture that anything that can die twice is immortal. Well, <laughs> so. Maybe we, maybe we should quote Landau more, more accurately. So Landau, first of all, talked about the Hamiltonian and not Lagrangian. And he talked only about the strong interactions. But then he said, we should bury the Hamiltonian, but with all the honors it deserves. <laughs> That's the exact quote from, well, except that he said it in Russian. <laughs> so you can do better than I do with that. But спасибо. John. You made an analogy between calculus and quantum field theory. I wonder whether you could put a third item of string theory and make a similar. Well, there are, uh, uh, we certainly should. And this would be another talk. But as one told us, string theory is the same as field theory. So I would lump both of them in the same, in the same box. There is something we, we're not thinking about it right. Maybe the classes of the just, just field theory have weak formulation. But this will also be a step toward the. String theory. There are many other examples of things that were invented for one thing, which are actually much more dramatic and failed for the thing that they, they were invented for, but then later turned out to be very important elsewhere. Supersymmetry was invented to explain why the neutrino is massless. That's the first time it appeared. You, you disagree with that. I expected you would disagree with that. And Young Mills theory was, was designed to explain the Rho meson and turned out to be a true, a true gauge theory. So the non-abelian gauge theory has a more natural setting 
than for, for just describing chromosomes. So there are many examples of deep ideas that were invented in not quite the right context, but later either moved to the right context or found a broader context. And that's usually a good sign. So when people criticize string theory, I think, or field theory for that matter, is that the fact that it has so many different unexpected and unplanned uh, applications, I think, is a sign that we're dealing with something extremely deep. I think I'm a f okay, Lenny. Uh, you yourself raised the question about the Hamiltonian. You yourself raised the question about the Hamiltonian. Do you think there's always a Hamiltonian? All right, time's up. <laughs> I took that so, uh, to be. Uh, <laughs> I plead the fifth. <laughs> let's uh, let's thank Nati again.